Hello, beautiful Lightfold souls. I am excited to have an author here today named Sheldon Lawrence. And I haven't interviewed enough authors who write about spiritual transformation, but since the beginning, I've wanted people to be inspired by near-death experiences and move these experiences into fiction. And that's exactly what he's done. And Sheldon has his PhD in English specializing in the literature of spiritual transformation. And this book is great. I actually listened to the Audible um, version of the book and, and it's entertaining. So I do encourage people to get that version of the book uh, because I just love the voices, but it's called Heaven Will Find You. Uh, you might recognize some of the experiences of near-death experiencers. Um, Howard Storms is one that comes to mind because there is uh, someone who goes to hell but also goes to heaven uh and 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 yet you did a great job of not making it overly traumatizing but but uh you know just walking that line you know to where you know we weren't you know like overly traumatized but but welcome <laughs> nice to have thank you here. thank you it's good to be here and i'm glad that you didn't find that too traumatizing i have had a few readers say that they didn't like that part and some of them even stopped right there and i thought well maybe i I didn't want to lay it on too thick, but but um, but yeah, I, I also wanted to convey, um, you know, that uh, I think it contrasts with with what comes later. So I tell people like, don't worry, the whole book isn't spent in the dark place. It it gets better. Stay with it. <laughs> yeah, well, it makes sense to me because it uh, it is a choice the way you present it that. That basically at the point, and I don't want to give too much away of your book, but at the point of his death, uh, he chooses to run from it instead of uh, taking the consequences of, of being dead. And so I think, you know, running away from the consequences of life, you know, that becomes this metaphor. And so even running away from death is a form of hell, just running away, um, you know, through addiction as um is the the metaphor and and the healing comes from facing it and the light is is always the great healer and i i love this line in your book about how no one comes to us pure you know that as as he's almost about to enter that heavenly realm someone's explaining that like hey no one enters this this realm pure you know the purest of the pure are not pure <laughs> and right. and uh there's there's something kind of comforting about that but so what made you interested in studying near-death experiences and, and spiritual transformative experiences? So just kind of start at the beginning for me. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, it was kind of from a, a, like a relatively young age, like even when I was a teenager, I was sort of, um, I don't know how to put it, it was just kind of existential. Like I was, I was contemplating, like, who are we? What are we doing here? Like, what is this all about? And um and i remember i live i lived in montana um in in west yellowstone montana and i remember something kind of random happened you know people die up there a fair amount in terms of just it's it's this adventure area and it's also kind of dangerous and um i was a teenager and they uh the news came that a couple of snowmobilers who rented snowmobiles from from our operation were caught in an avalanche and that's what I'd heard. And then, and then later, my dad came in and said, uh, "They died. These men died. Uh, both of them in the avalanche." And it it had just struck me like um, something about that. I mean, I'd I'd heard of people dying. It wasn't like that was the first time, but for something about that, just like the finality of it. And wow, what what is that about? And I I picked up books on NDEs. Um, and I had you know I I'd grown up religious, but still like in terms of like what what actually happens after death? What is there? Uh, what's it like? And so I started reading from a, a fairly young age and I've never fully stopped. Like I've always been, you know, fascinated with that to hear the accounts of people who have gone there and, and caught in a glimpse of it, you know, and, and I have just, I, I've been, I've been fascinated with that ever since. And um, yeah. And I have to say you did a good job of, capturing those in-between realms that people talk about, um, the idea of ghosts and the idea of, you know, all those different realms, really, 
uh, what's, what was the hardest part to write about? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think probably that, that first section, because I, I, you know, the, the, the NDE literature paints a portrait when you read a lot of them, when you read a, like a broad spectrum of these accounts, it paints a fairly complex portrait of the afterlife. It's not just like, oh, there's, you know, there's heaven and there's the angels with their harps and everything's great. It's like, it's, it's a very complex and multi-layered world. And I, I find that fascinating. Um, and so the question then arises like, well, what about many NDEs report that there are darker realms, that it's not all flowers and meadows, that there there are darker regions of the afterlife. And um, I think that was kind of difficult to write about. Um, not so much that I'm necessarily afraid of that, but I I wanted the book to be more uplifting and inspiring. And I'm like, how much time do I spend in this darker reality? Like what Howard Storm experienced in his near-death experience. Um, so that was probably the most challenging thing to write about um, is how how do I depict that without because I don't believe in a hell that was like created by God to punish sinners. Um, I, I that's not part of my belief system. So I, but yet what then? What is this place? It's a it's a place um, where people through their choices, like like Howard Storm says, is like. I was with people who were like me. It, no one sent me there. I wasn't being punished. I had, I was sort of like magnetically pulled into this direction because that's where I was spiritually at that time in my life. And um, and so that's what I wanted to depict. How can I depict hell without the you know the tropes of you know devils and you know fire or whatever? Because because like I, I don't believe that. But what would hell? look like what how and why would someone get trapped there that's the question c.s lewis says uh the gates of hell are locked from the inside you know and so it's a self it, it, it's a self-confinement and so what would cause someone to get sort of trapped in that realm and that was that was the it was kind of fun to think through that but you know it's also a not necessarily the best place to be even as a writer you know writing through that <laughs> Yeah, and then you're, yeah, some people do get turned off by that idea or are afraid of that idea, you know, the the uh, depths of it, um, certainly. And, and yet, I find, you know, the part that fascinated me the most as a healer is that middle realm, you know, the realm of addiction, mm -hmm. you know, the, mm -hmm. the realm of, um, and this is after my NDE, I saw in the streets of New Orleans, you know, I was sober and I was with this sober painter and we were watching and we both had, you know, this kind of sight and we could see spirits enter the bodies of very, very oh, wow. drunk, um, very altered people. And we saw at the exact same time, a pirate enter a very drunk man. And we both, you know, like, like right. saw and, they, and he entered the same way you described it. Like he just kind of entered his body for a moment and, you know, animated him. And so when, when you write about that, I'm like, yeah, I think people do use the energy of, of very altered people. And so, you know, that's, that's a, a weird thing to think about, <laughs> but I, I think I, I do caution people, you know, to, you know, don't get so drunk and, and so out there that, that you can be used by the spirits, you know, yes. and certainly there is a calling back of your own energy from times, even, you know, when you're under with anesthesia and, and other things. Right. And and that actually, you know, now that you bring that up, that was it's something that I've reflected on after writing about that. And that's fascinating to hear your story of, of seeing that, um, you know, part of that section was inspired by um, George Ritchie's uh, Return from Tomorrow, where he he's in a bar as a spirit. He's in a bar and witnessing these other spirits, like wanting to sort of like jump into drunk people to, I guess, experience the old days, like what it was like to feel drunk. And so um but at the same time, it's weird, you know, it's, it's, uh, and, and I don't, and it's not like I want to scare people or, and, it's, you know, you think of that as like, well, what are they possessed now? Is it like the exorcist, they have to have, you know, have some demon cast out of them. And like, no, I don't think that. I think that they're probably just sort of 
trying to get a contact high, trying to feed off some of those old addictions that they that they liked. And it's creepy to think about, right? Um, yeah. But but you know, who knows? Maybe maybe that's what's going on. Yeah, to some degree, yes. Like it was just like a wind, or you know, he just kind of blew through this guy. But it was, you know, the the vibration, the way you wrote it, it it seemed accurate that that they're vibing on the same level. And then you know, it was someone from so long ago that was still around. So it was just bizarre, you know. Just there, there are many mysteries of life, and I think your writing did a good job of capturing the things that people with these visions or these sights uh, can see. Uh, now, on a philosophical level, what did this, what did writing this teach you, uh, this book? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, I, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think that the, the biggest thing, you know, as I was writing it, um and and you're you're a writer you know you know what it's like when you're in the flow right when you feel like oh, this is just this is just coming you know and 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 that's what it often felt like it felt like a download and i'm not saying that like you know god was just bringing to my ear or something but it did feel like i was you know kind of connected while writing it and um and so yeah i i i felt like i was learning as i wrote and um I think, you know, philosophically, the biggest thing is just the, that, that, that God is patient, that our, that our angels are patient, that um, this, you know, there's, there's a sense of exploration in, in the novel and that this soul is, it's like when he's ready, when he's had enough of a certain energy level and he's gotten bored with it or he sees that it's a dead end and that it's not going anywhere, then he's kind of like ready to level up. But I think that, that God is compassionate in allowing us to do that, to explore, to, to, to find out um, which path we want to take and maybe exhaust ourselves on a certain path. And, and then we are ready to like, okay, I've had enough of that. What's more, what's next with, you know, there has to be more this feels like a dead end you know it's like when when the soul was you know this the main character was in the um the earthly realm that you're talking about where he's kind of just hanging out and cruising around at first that's just a blast to him he's just loving it you know it's just like wow this freedom this you know i can go anywhere i can see anything um but even those those sort of pleasures those things will wear out and you're kind of like wait a minute i'm just kind of i'm kind of getting stuck here but but i guess the the bigger picture is i think that uh, philosophically uh, god is patient heaven and the spirit worlds are complex they're they're multi-layered and um we're there to there's nothing wrong necessarily with being at a particular level if that's where we are and and we have to learn ourselves out of that we have to um if we're there it's it's for a certain reason and we have to process whatever energy or emotion is is binding us there however long that takes and then god is ready to say okay here's, here's the next level we can level up <laughs> so like uh, do you think some people i know believe that people who are very religious might go into realms of heaven where they are held there for a while and told they're right, you know, so that they can not be shocked, you know, by by uh, by anything that that discounts that or discredits that. Yes, totally. And there's there's a scene in there where um, where a, a guy is pretty upset that things aren't turning out the way he thought they would, and 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 soon kind of like his expectation of an angel comes and takes him to where he will be more comfortable. And I think that's so compassionate, you know, it's, it's, I think that there's a lot of uh, compassion in that transition from earth life to heavenly life. Um, there's a lot of detoxing <laughs> maybe that happens in healing. Um, but also sort of, uh, I don't know, I've likened it to if we were in a play um, and we're actors on a stage um, and we had forgotten that we were in a play, 
we had forgotten that we were playing a part. You know, I, I'd forgotten that I was playing Hamlet, that I'm not actually Hamlet. Um, <clears throat> and then maybe, you know, imagine being taken off stage and somebody saying, hey, guess what? You're not really Hamlet. That was a part you were playing. Uh, that could be extremely unsettling if I'm absolutely convinced I'm happy, <laughs> you know. And so I think there's a transition phase where, where yes, people are compassionately allowed to kind of slowly relearn. I think it's a relearning. Yeah. Um, one, re of the, <laughs> one of the things you wrote that struck me about being on Earth and and blowing through things and feeling like earth was a hologram you know the character was realizing oh earth that's the exactly the way i felt in the hospital when i blew through the hospital walls and i'd never realized it that way i felt like as the spirit i was like oh i you know am am you know transparent and i'm going through the walls but but yeah that's another way of looking at it you know the, the earth was a hologram but one of the first things i thought and a lot of people who who believe in that theory that you know this is um you know not real you know one of the first things i thought was oh this is all theater you know that was the first huh. thought that that i had oh, and yeah. What do you make of of those theories of people believing that you know this is theater or just a lesson? Um, you know, I, I, you know, the, the, so there are kind of like more extreme philosophies that say this this is all a dream; it's not reality. Um, and I I tend to not resonate with with that so much. Um, but I do think. Uh, identity is not as solid as we th think. You know, like right now, I have, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a college professor. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I have certain interests and hobbies, and and these things that I think are my identity, I think, I will discover that it's more of like an earthly identity, and that my heavenly identity is something deeper and much more expansive, right? And so, um, yeah, in terms of but in terms of life being a lesson, you know, that's something that I have. And in the NDE literature, there's a little bit of, I guess, disagreement about this question. Is is life uh, a lesson uh, where we, we must learn certain spiritual truths in order to break, progress as souls? Or is it just an experience um, where we... Um, you know, is it part of soul evolution or are we already evolved souls just having a human experience because it's interesting? I don't know. <laughs> do, you, do you have a take on that, Trisha? Yeah, you know, I, the thing that hit me was that I was never the same. So as soon as I saw, you know, that this this life, this vehicle, you know, this body um, was informed by the light, you know, that it was healed by the light, you know, that the light was the truth, that that changed me so deeply, you know, at this really deep level that, that I saw myself more as light and I saw this body as very temporary. And so it became hard to, and I know this sounds weird, but feel attached to anything for very long you know here so you know say yeah i i just realized the temporary nature of everything here and the the minute you know that there's death i also feel like yes there's incredible grief and i understand and i will grieve you know and and i have grieved you know like the loss of my dad and and i will continue to grieve people but i also get this excitement about seeing them again in a way that i don't think other people fully understand and so i think there's um a weird switch that i have and i think that near death experiencers have that other people I wish I could give it to them. I wish I could just like inject them, you know, with this knowing because I, I encounter a lot of people in grief who they want to know that, you know, like they really want to know that. And so um, did do you think that you uh, basically met grief head on in this book and encountered, you know, that level of, of, uh, of, of what uh, grief is like? 
Um, I yeah, I mean, that's a an interesting observation because um, um, my dad had passed away. Oh, probably only like four or five years before I wrote this, and that was very much on my mind, you know. And and it's not like we we didn't have a a troubled relationship, but we weren't necessarily super close either. Um, so it was um, so this idea of reconciling, this idea of 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 a spirit coming to his son and saying like, I need to tell you my story. <laughs> Uh, that that kind of intimacy, like we need to, sh I need to share you with you my story. Um, that was that was definitely on my mind, um, and so yeah. In terms of meeting grief, I don't, you know, because I I haven't had an NDE. I don't think I have that same level of perspective and and almost detachment. Um, I, when I'm feeling you know, when I'm on kind of like a spiritual high, I think I, I get close to that. Um, but I think, this, you know, still kind of the heaviness of life. And um, I, I feel that. I feel that often. You know? <laughs> um, so, yeah. It's it's a different way of being, and and I understand that. I think that's why a lot of indie ears work with the dying, you know, like because it's just so easy for us. You know, death is it, it, there's a deep acceptance there. Um, I do want to read a line from your book and kind of switch gears. There was um, there was something that a near death experiencer Jeff Olson said in an interview that really deeply touched me. And your writing kind of echoed something of his. And I don't know if if uh, you got this from him or if you just you know like you know came to this moment. But in your book, you wrote the light came in, and this time um, taught me. It told me that the moment at the hospital was not in the past. It existed as it happened forever and ever. It possessed a separate reality and any perceived failures that came after could not destroy it. In that moment, I was a good father. I loved and cared for my family. The moment lived forever, pure and undefiled. If that moment contained an indestructible goodness, then perhaps something good in me could also live forever. And so that beauty of, you know, what is true and pure lives forever in heaven and you can experience it and go back to those moments. I see that as a medium, like I see people going back and reliving moments that are beautiful, like say someone loved their life before World War II, before it was destroyed, you know, by by bombs, they might actually go live in that home, you know, before the war or, you know, just in a, a time of innocence and beauty and, and peace. And so, you know, people can hold on to what is beautiful and pure and, and, and so, and they can live in it. And Jeff Olson talks about holding his son before his son died. And when he got to go to heaven, he got to hold his son again and smell him and feel him and, and really experience it. Yeah, that is that is amazing. I love his story. I hadn't read it when I wrote this book. I, I wasn't familiar with it yet, but um, that is an interesting parallel. And and I do I find hope in that because um, life can get heavy. You know, the longer you live, the more like these experiences accumulate, and it it's easy to feel like you know kind of weighed down by it, like. Um, I'm not as good now as I used as I was ten years ago or something like that, you know, like I uh or but but you know, that who who we were at a different time and like you know, at a different time when maybe we were on top of our game and we were loving and generous and kind, that is as much a reality as whatever difficulty we're going through right now, you know. And and I think that 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 God will look at the big picture, <laughs> you know, that that it, we are you know, we're, we we are complex beings who who kind of live almost simultaneously in different dimensions and, and different moments. Um, those those past moments are as much a part of us as anything, and so I think that that's and maybe it gives them some perspective to not get too discouraged about if we're going through a difficult time. That like, no, this is who I am. This is my real reality. And it's like, no, it's a phase. It's one part of a much more complex and beautiful picture. 
So I have a question about, um, and this is a little bit, you know, off topic from the book, but one of the ideas that you put out in the book is that, you know, your vibration takes you to different levels. And so in the spiritual world, people are often talking about, you know, the more you vibrate on this level of light, the, the more, um, you know, beautiful experiences you're going to bring into this world. However, it does seem like there's a lot of negativity or fear in the world currently, and certainly through our media outlets and a lot of anxiety that, you know, we hear students are dealing with. Um, do you feel that there's a mix between hope, a lot of hope with students and, and hope for the future and a lot of anxiety? And, and what do you do? Do you hope that, you know, a book like yours and, and putting out a message of light, um, you know, helps them imagine a better future? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, um, yeah, like you said, it is, it is a difficult time. And I think the, one of the difficulties is, you know, you know, life on earth has always been difficult. There's always been war. There's always been violence. There's always been, but never before has it been so much in our face and literally on our phone, you know, that you can scroll through Instagram or any app and, be exposed to just, just like really low vibrational stuff, you know, uh, violence or just, just kind of trashy stuff. And I think that's my biggest concern in terms of students and my own children is just, um, you really have to ex consciously and intentionally expose yourself to the light because uh, you can go down a rabbit hole of, of, you know, dark places on the internet or, or different apps and kind of get sucked into that. And so more than those of us who grew up in the nineties, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, we had TV and movies and all that, but it just, it wasn't just like constant screen time and, and just so accessible. And uh, so that, that is my concern. Yes. And, but also my hope is that this idea of, um, you know, the, the main character of, my story he that's one of his biggest lessons is that wherever he is vibrating he you know that's that's what is attracted to him and that and what he is attracted to like the moment when he's when he's the first on earth he's just sort of hey i remember this is this is this is earth and it was such a relief to be there instead of the more hellish realm that he was before um but as he kind of started remembering and craving his old addictions he slowly dropped down in frequency and different beings started to become visible to him um, because he was vibrating at their, their frequency. And so that, that is a message that I would definitely, you know, like people to take from the, the book is that um, wherever you're vibrating that, you know, we're magnets and that's, what's going to, what's what we're going to attract and what we be attracted to so just to be you know more conscious about the kind of light or lack thereof that we're taking in and uh there's a the question of atheist in the afterlife uh i'd like you to address that i think that one's kind of a, a funny question but uh, would you like to talk about that yeah so uh, another big part of my inspiration for this type of writing is um the, the thought of Emanuel Swedenborg and um, and this idea of like a complex heaven and that that um, that there are those who pass on you know there are atheists in the afterlife and <laughs> that who um, either don't believe that they've actually died or are just sort of in a, a state of confusion about what's going on um, and and yeah and I think to the extent that our beliefs can continue with us, especially if we're pretty like rigid and dogmatic. Um, our beliefs, you know, we will carry them into the next life. And if, and if we were real, we're really stuck on them, we'll, we'll continue to defend them. And so I think, you know, one of the, the characters in the book, you know, he is um, an atheist and he has a pretty complex or at least um, I think convincing argument about what might be going on. And, you know, uh, that doesn't have to account for some bigger picture. He won't admit that he might have been wrong. And so he's kind of like coming up with alternative theories about why he continues to exist. And and I think that that's, that 
the spectrum of belief that exists on this planet will exist there and probably even more variety. And uh, yeah, I like that. And the importance of facing our lives here. I mean, I, I think psychology certainly tells us to do that for the sake of, of growth, but on a spiritual level too, I think there's a uh, greater healing and you open yourself to better experiences, but uh, what do you think about processing? Yeah, I mean, that's um, so many of the things in this book I was writing and thinking like, yeah, I really need to practice this. <laughs> you know, I need to do better. <laughs> it's, it's not written from the point of view of a, of a guru who's like, got this all figured out. It's definitely like, yeah, I know that what I'm writing here is true. And I it's definitely something that I can improve on. And that is um, facing uh you know face, facing things uh in the here and now and um processing that experience so it's like you know the the life review in an, in an nde that that is a hallmark of so many ndes um if we can kind of practice to the extent possible a life review here I mean, you know, not in that, that sort of 3D depth that the end of years experience, but at least that bring that awareness to our daily actions, our motives, what we're doing and why, and kind of review and reflect on that and, and to process through those experiences. If we've had trauma in our past, and, and your book is wonderful uh, in, in addressing this, uh, confronting past trauma and healing it um it's it's hard but i think that the more that we can do that here the better right and, and not just kind of put the oh I'll, I'll worry about that in the next life but um i think the intention is that we the more we can process that here you know the better and, and confront things and i'm i'm a natural avoider i'll admit it i'm a natural avoider like i like oh, i don't want to really think about that right now i don't want to talk about it you know and my wife is, oh, she's the opposite. She's always like, no, we got to deal with this. Let's talk about it. Let's talk through it. Let's, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, people often gravitate to each other to find a happy medium because <laughs> there is a, a happy medium there. <laughs> you know, there's too much talking and then there's too much avoiding. <laughs> you know, you yeah. go fun sometimes and you, you do have to work through things. And, and certainly, you know, the, the benefit of, of working through something is not having it come back and bite you later, you know, of, of having it, you know, rear up and, and go, whoa, I didn't deal with this. And now here it is coming to, back to get me. And uh, yeah. And Cause, so cause there's the, the other danger of, and Eckhart totally talks about this in some of his works of um, creating an identity of your pain, creating an identity um, it that becomes your new identity instead of something to to work through and to help others heal it becomes so much part of your story that that, that that's a new attachment and that's who you are that your trauma defines you and i think that can be a, a danger in um you know i guess just something to look out for uh, yeah. you know in trying to heal from things yeah you know there was this moment when I realized, and this was a cool moment in the classroom when I realized like my trauma didn't even really matter. It just mattered that I was supporting others and healing. Like it was, it was a really cool moment because, you know, for a long time it had mattered. And then I was like, no, it's just really cool that, you know, this person is working through something that happened to him with a priest. And this woman is working through being bullied while she was in the military and this part, you know, like, it was just, you know, like people are working through all kinds of things. You know, this other person is working through her family being, you know, murdered. I mean, like, you know, everyone has trauma, you know, like everyone has all kinds of different trauma that, you know, plays out in different ways. And, you know, as we help one another through it, um, we, we really see greater growth and, and yeah, that identity, you're right, of identifying with anything too much, like ultimately the light kind of expands us into this place of, ooh, yeah, oneness and, and, and greater connection and healing. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. So I do want to ask too, and 
I just kind of know it intuitively, but maybe you have, since this is your specialty, I know there's an importance to writing about speculative fiction of the afterlife. And I think, I think people attack personally, you know, me and other indie ears. And that's why I want people to write about it in fiction. They can't attack you in the same way. You're just writing fiction, you know, like, you know, like, you're writing. <laughs> you know? and so that's, that's why I want people to write fiction. But what, why do you think it's important that people write about uh, these concepts in fiction? Well, you know, uh, fiction, I mean, it's kind of a, a cliche that sometimes um you know fiction like tells the truth better than the truth you know and you, and you know from studying english and literature that um some of the, you know the greatest novels teach profound spiritual truths and and what it and the difference between that and memoir and memoir is beautiful i, I love memoir but um it, is that it does kind of liberate you to um to, to explore and put pieces together. So I'm like writing this book. I had read so many NDEs and, and gleaned so much from all of them. I just thought it would be cool to have kind of uh, this, this, this story that, that patches, you know, the pieces together, so many of these components, right? And so kind of this, um, this, this epic NDE <laughs> experience that, that brings in uh, so many different true experiences in as reported in the NDE literature and it's just like a, a novel it's never complete fiction you know um, Jane Eyre is based largely on the life of Charlotte Bronte and you know it's it's like so much of her personal experience finds its way into there but she wasn't bound by it she wasn't confined by it she could explore uh, themes that uh, were outside of maybe her own autobiography, and I think that that is important. It's a, it's an important kind of uh, <clears throat> to have both. You need the, the the true stories. You need the memoirs. You need those who are saying like, "Hey, this this actually happened to me. I'm not just making this up. I'm not embellishing it. Like this is my story." Um, <clears throat> but then to have something else that that says this is going to be exploring those themes, like true themes true experiences but without being bound to one particular story you know it's going to be kind of a patchwork and that's that's what i was you know that that wasn't necessarily the kernel the seed of this book the seed of this book was um i kind of just like had an image in my mind of a lost soul in the afterlife and it has always made me wonder what how does a lost soul get found how does a, a trapped soul get what what would their adventure look like? What would tempt them? What would um, hold them back? What fears would they would would a soul deal with? Because I think we sometimes have this idea that, or at least I I did before that like oh once you die like the curtain comes up and all the truth is revealed it all makes sense and and um and guess what like you know here was the true religion or there wasn't a true religion or here's like let's let's just answer all the questions instantly and um, I don't. Some kind of have those epiphanic experiences, but um, others are confused. And I think so. What? How? How could you work from confusion and woundedness? What would that journey look like in the afterlife? And so that was the actual seed. But at the same time, I thought in exploring that question, it'll be such a, a fun opportunity to bring in so many of the truths I've learned in studying NDEs over the years. I love it. And one of the things that I think I've heard, and I don't know who says this quote, but when you write a memoir, people believe you're lying your ass off. And when you write fiction, people are looking at it going, oh, that's got to be true. I bet, it, I bet he's the one that did that. And you know, like, they're, they're going to be looking at your book going, well, it did <laughs> Did his father do this? Did he have that problem? With his son? You know, like, <laughs> That's so funny because I've had people ask me exactly that. Like, wait a minute, is this is this about your dad? You know, it, wait, did you did you do this? It sounds kind of like you know <laughs> that type of thing. So yeah, that's 
That's so funny. <laughs> People always assume. <laughs> right. <laughs> so at, at this point, I want to write fiction, you know, moving forward, or at least fictionalize things. <laughs> There's yeah. freedom and joy in it. You know, it, it gives you more and more room to write. <laughs> but yeah, and there's so much power in your book, for example. Um, and like you, you know, when you're talking about helping students, uh, you know, just in your sharing, I I appreciate it. when I was reading your book, I thought it's very brave of you to share your story with your students because, as as you know, so often in academia, these kinds of stories are frowned upon. Like, oh, let's not get too woo woo. Let's not get out there. Let's keep it, you know. And <clears throat> but in sharing your story, it's not obviously you weren't trying to convert them to to some new thing, but it in sharing your story, it. Uh, it, it seems like it really liberated them to open up about their issues and their, their lives, things that they've gone through. I think that's really powerful. Yeah, it, it does allow people to, I think not just students, but all people, it allows them to talk about their experiences with ghosts and, you know, with their grandfather coming to them in the dream. And that's one of the beautiful things I love about talking about near-death experiences is we've all had, most of us have had some kind of spiritual experience. You know, like every crowd I've talked to, about 80 to 90% of people raise their hands and say, you know, I've had some kind of experience. And so, you know, I think we need to talk about that more. Yeah. And I, and yeah, especially in academic settings, um, uh, I think that it'd be nice if that were less, less taboo, I guess. Yeah. Well, you teach um, about the literature. So tell me, tell my audience, what are some great books that you think people should read that talk about spiritual awakenings and Oh, um, well, yeah, I, as we've talked about, I mean, the, some, the NDE books um, I've, I've really appreciated are, you know, Return from Tomorrow, um, Howard Storm's uh, story, um, Mary Neal. So, I mean, that, and yours, like, they, that's like this, this, this whole like, super rich collection of um, near-death experience books. Um, I... I was really struck by C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, uh, which is a kind of like mine in the sense that it's a, a fictional imagining of um, a soul sort of getting an opportunity to leave hell. Um, and so that was, and then again, you know, he, the soul sort of witnesses different conversations that angels are having with uh, spirits who are, are trapped and getting in arguments and it's it really struck me to see uh you know a spirit arguing with this angel of light like well no it can't be that way yeah you've got to be wrong about that and and because we get so stuck in our way of thinking that yeah you know, <laughs> and so um or, or there's certain, certain addictions they don't want to give up or there's no way that so-and-so can be in heaven he was he was worse than me like how, what's he doing there like that's not fair, you know that that sort of thing. Um, yeah, C.S. Lewis is the Great Divorce. Um, Love that. I read that as a kid. Believe it or not, loved it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, off the top of my head, I, you know, so many books are, you know, about spiritual. Tra like, I've, I've read a, a few of Gandhi's, um, like autobiographies and biographies like his spiritual transformation is absolutely fascinating and inspiring you know so i think it's important to also get outside your own tradition and um so uh, another book that was fascinating to me was autobiography of a yogi by uh, yes. Paramahansa yogananda love that yeah. book love yes. that book yes yeah, both of those and i think both of those books are important today because we're forgetting the art of uh, nonviolent resistance, you know, just that idea of, yes, war is terrible and, you know, violence is terrible. And how did we change it in the past? Through peace and through love and through meditation and, you know, not through anger and hating one another. And, and I think that's the, you know, if I ever lead anything at my campus, I think it will really be a meditation. You know, it will truly be like around peace and love for this world, you know, not not hate for any one side or any anything but you know how can we spread peace and unity and 
and really just imagining this world, um, you know, the way uh, other people have in the past. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and that, that is such a, I mean, just that the whole, uh, you know, spiritual quest of, of taking a step back. I think that's one of the problems and I don't know if to blame it on the internet or, or phones or whatever, but we get so much in the weeds of like these conflicts. There's like algorithms love conflict. You know, yeah. it just accelerates. It just accelerates and it keeps feeding more. And I, I think that's such a problem. So to, just to step out and read some of this literature and to get, I, I read a book with my students. Um, it's um, The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Leo Tolstoy. Love that book. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. It's it's not one that's like widely read. And so, and and they, they look at me like, why? <laughs> why, like, why are we reading this? So I really have to kind of build it up for him. But it's like, like listen, like he, you know, he's on his deathbed, and having these regrets about his this life where he's just sold out to looking good and playing a part, and um, you know, not really engaging with people deeply because it gets messy. And I'm like, so this can be a cautionary tale. Like you're all young. Like you know, <laughs> like it now is the time to be thinking about these existential questions, uh, not on your deathbed i guess that's better than nothing but still like like this is the time to read this kind of book and so we have we have some good discussions about it yeah yeah that's a great book yeah just i love the russian writers in in general you know some of my favorites uh but yeah those are those are great you know i was thinking about this recently i was as a kid growing up in lindell texas um uh, david wilkerson who wrote the uh cross and the switch Blade. He was this um, minister who he grew up in. If you haven't heard of him, he was he grew up in uh, Pennsylvania. He felt the Holy Spirit called him to go to New York, and he was just this 18 year old pastor. And he started preaching to gang members and different people who were pretty tough. And he got them off the streets. And in the middle of Manhattan, he opened up a teen rescue center and and got all these kids off drugs and. Um, he was just known for that, but he brought his headquarters like right where I was born and he used to preach holding me, you know, sometimes my mom was this young mom. And, and so he picked me up as a baby, you know, like, cause I was crying and, and I knew him and read his book as a young kid and, and his ministry just always struck me because he said things like, look, you can't tell people they're wrong and they're going to hell. You have to, if you see a dog with a bone, you can't grab the bone out of its mouth. You have to hand him a lamp chop. And so he was like part of that movement of, you know, Jesus is great. Jesus is love. Uh, you know, yeah, it's not yeah. denominational, that Jesus movement, which was like full of joy. And so um, it was a beautiful movement. And that was a part of Christianity that I really did love as a kid. And so I saw... I saw that he he was selling love. He wasn't selling judgment. And so that was the yeah. right way to go about it, I think, because all these people, and, and I saw them as kids, were very artistic, but they left a life of drugs and a life of, you know, kind of like a hard life to come to East Texas and make records, you know, for kids. That, that's fascinating. Is that kind of brand of Christianity are preachers like him still out there? Uh, have you seen a shift uh, one way or another? Yeah, unfortunately, the 80s kind of shifted a lot of things into big mega churches. And I think, you know, like evangelical ministries kind of shifted in general, um, you know, in, in most of the country. But that's the 70s were, you know, like a beautiful time um, in in Christianity when a lot of people broke away from non-denominational, you know, like, hey, let's just love Jesus. You know, there was that movement. That's, that's fascinating. I, that's, so one of the criticisms of my book, and it's, I haven't gotten it a lot, but a, a, a few have pushed back and said, um, there's no Jesus in this. Where's Jesus in this book? And, and there is mention of Christ and Christ consciousness, but it's definitely not sort of a, an evangelical fundamentalist take on the afterlife, right? Right. But I, I found it, you know, I found it interesting in, in your memoir, you, you kind of had this, it sounds like you, you've had this conflicted relationship with traditional Christianity. Um, 
and yet there's a moment in the end where where you kind of like feel the presence of, of Jesus when you're, you're you're praying in in a church. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. And that was that was surprising. Like I was criticized, you know, by my family for not seeing Jesus, and then many years later, I felt this healing presence of Jesus, and I do see Jesus as a healer you know, that his spiritual presence is deeply healing or that Christ consciousness, you know, however you want to see it. I do think that people use uh, Christianity to shame other people and to, and to judge them. I mean, like, you know, in your notes to me, you, you uh, wanted me to ask you about Christianity having a hell problem. And I think it, it does, you know, like, there are people in my own family who just from the way I talk, I think they're excited in their own minds that I might go to hell. And to me, that is so wrong. You know, like, I'm like, that's just not loving. Number one, I don't want anyone, you know, I want everyone to be able to be healed, you know, like, you know, just to have that opportunity in the afterlife, no matter how horrible they are to be, you know, re-educated, you know, like taken into that realm, however long it takes, if it takes, you know, they've got eternity to be re-educated, you know, and, and healed. Um, I don't want anyone to be tortured and, and, you know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem right. I think that, that wanting or taking any kind of pleasure in someone going to hell is itself a pretty dark and mentally sinful place to be, right? I mean, if there's anything that, yeah, that you'd have to sort of work through would be that desire. And yeah, I, I, um, and that is one of the things I tried to convey in my book is that it, it's, you know, maybe there are some who kind of go to another thing and say like, there, there absolutely is no hell. Everything's forgiven instantly and everything's all, uh, great. And it's not that I, I would have a problem with that. Like, I don't need anyone to go to hell, but to the extent we have agency in this world, hell exists on this earth but you know and so to say that it, it could continue at least for a time after i don't think that's a, a crazy proposition to say that as we're working through issues that, that that is a hellish kind of thing it's it's a far cry from eternal punishment and torment i yeah i i explicitly unapologetically un, unapologetically reject that and and that's not even that's the thing is that 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 concept of hell is not essential to Christianity. Early Christian thinkers rejected that as well. Um, there is, I can't remember the title of the book, but the author is David Bentley Hart. He's a theologian and he writes extensively. I mean, he's just absolutely brilliant about Christian history and theology. And he just completely debunks the idea of hell and says it was a later development in the theology. It mostly had to do with scaring people and wanting your enemies to go somewhere terrible. It wasn't actually part of the original picture. Yeah, so, yeah. it seems that to be a part of that Puritan streak. You know, like if you look at a lot of that literature, uh, you know, Jonathan Edwards preaching and making people faint, you know, out of <laughs> great fear. And, uh, and I just think, you know, some of that still, even though it's not, you know, literally there are no Puritans now, it, it's the streaks of it run through certain parts of, of uh, our religions. And uh, yeah, and and that judgment is always not what I felt from God over there. But I, I do think that even near-death experiencers, even though I have no fear of death, there is a certain element of mystery. Like, even though I still get glimpses you know, from my father, when I'm asked to do readings about what people do over there, I don't claim to have all the answers, you know, like, the, I don't know, what, how, where does eternity end, you know, where does, you know, light doesn't go on forever, you know, like, and, you know, and what, where, where does, where does the light end, you know, where, where do you, what does it, you know, like, what does all of this mean? I mean, what do you think about, you know, the mystery of it all? Well, I, I think that that is, um, essential to a robust spirituality is to is to make friends with mystery um the, there's such a a tendency and temptation to, to want certainty like you know i think it's a very human temptation to want certainty 
And that's why people who are very dogmatic in their religion are very threatened when anyone calls into question some of the truths that they hold dear is that it, it shakes them because they, they love certainty so much. And um, I think in, to keep an open mind and to keep learning, we have to make our peace with mystery and not only just make our peace with it, but embrace it um, as something that's kind of beautiful. Like our, our little mammalian brains cannot comprehend what is going on here. It's so big. It's so vast. It's so varied, and I think we can look at that with a sense of kind of like fear and kind of want to retreat back into our village, or we can say like, "Wow, okay, let's let's explore what's going on here." And I, and so that's uh, yeah, I think that that's important to um, we can have certain convictions of we can be certain that that love and forgiveness is is the answer you know, that healing is important, like certain things like that. But, you know, whether the pearly gates swing inward or outward and that we should just <laughs> keep an open mind about all those. I think you said actually really well in, in towards the end of your book is that like, let's let's let the details take care of themselves and, and certainly not do something so ridiculous as, as argue with each other and call each other heretics because someone else's details are different than my details, you know, so yeah. Yeah, that what I do know are the basics, that love is all that we take with us into that realm, and that love is an action. It's not something that we just sit around and collect, you know, that it's something we do, and it's, you know, in those kindnesses that we give to the world and that we give to the people around us, and so, you know, that compassion and love is important. Yeah, well, I think your book is wonderful. So uh, definitely, I'll put the links below. And uh, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of of Audible books. And whoever um, you know did the different voices for Heaven Will Find You, um, I I think they did a fantastic job. <laughs> there's there's many different characters, so you know, there's some you know interesting characters in there. <laughs> it's actually a stage actor by training, so I think that that's part of it. Oh, that, yeah, that it was it was entertaining. <laughs> so I'll put your links below and uh, I hope other people uh, find it and enjoy it as much as I did. But thank you for this interesting conversation. Thank you so much.